Well, the book of Joel <coughs> and the book of Ezekiel, we will pick up again here this morning and I've been teaching on the book of Joel, three small chapters, how it's a panoramic view of uh, the end times and God pouring out his uh, spirit between uh, Joel chapter 2 and chapter 3, we uh, start getting the revelation of Ezekiel can be inserted right in that area and we can get more detail. There again, Joel's a panoramic view. We get more detail into that panoramic view. We can go to the book of uh, Ezekiel. Uh, here we can see that in the book of Joel, it is speaking about when an invasion comes against the nation Israel. And I want to move quite quickly through the first of this, but it's important for us to get our minds back on the same track. Jerusalem is about to be destroyed. Um, the armies of Babylon are about to attack. And we see that complaining is a Babylonian connection. So what started Israel into this, uh, into this negative uh, mindset was their constant complaining. And we can see when you, have you ever been around a bunch of people that complain? You, know, you can walk into an atmosphere that is nothing but complaining. Now complaining is just a negative, complaining is negative any way you I've heard of constructive criticism, but it's still a negative, right? I mean, there's no way you can make a complaining is always bringing something negative into the conversation. And this is what happened to Israel. They had such a constant complaining, and ultimately complaining, whether we realize it or not, we're basically complaining against God. Now, so, now as Israel turns from God, they do this by complaining and uh, worshiping Baal. They drove God out of the culture. Uh, they uh, turned from God by complaining and worshiping this star. We've been over that, sexualizing culture. And they turned from God by complaining and worshiping Moloch, which is the sacrificing of children. So we can see that Israel did this big about face. It was always a, a mystery to me how in the world the nation Israel could turn from God so quickly. Did anybody else feel that way? Until I am now uh, 60, in my 60s, and I'm seeing America turn from God in one generation. So I'm like, I guess it's, it's uh, if something, if a truth is not taught, it's lost. Right. It's what happens. So if a truth is not taught, we can see it is lost. So then we get into the book of Ezekiel here. Ezekiel was, he was a priest living in Jerusalem during the first Babylonian attack. I've taught you this, that he was being raised and bred as a priest. <clears throat> now chapters 1 through 3, we see that Ezekiel gets commissioned. Y'all remember the teaching on that. Something happens in chapters 1 through 3. Uh, Ezekiel gets commissioned by God, but it's in a vision. Now here's the, here's the issue of Ezekiel 1 through 3. Ezekiel has this vision of he's sitting on a water bank. The heavens open up. He sees this vision of God in the heavens. Now Ezekiel was a priest living in Jerusalem during the first Babylonian attack. The book of Ezekiel begins five years after he was taken captive. Very important. Ezekiel's in Jerusalem. He's being raised to be a priest. He's 25 years old. Babylon comes in, attacks Israel. Ezekiel, the prophet, gets captured. He wasn't a prophet that time. He was a priest. He's captured. He's taken into captivity into Babylon. And when he was there for five years, he's sitting on a riverbank, and he starts, and this vision begins. He was sitting on a bank of uh, irrigation canal, and it was his 30th birthday, five years later, the time he would have been installed as a priest. So he was kind of sad on the, on the uh, irrigation canal bank. He was sad. He was supposed to become a priest. That was his birthday, on his birthday, 30th year. But he's in captivity. So he would not be a priest. How could he be? Because the temple's back in Jerusalem, and he's in Babylon. 
Now, all of a sudden, uh, Ezekiel sitting there on that canal bank, he has his vision and he sees this open vision of these angels and the platform. Uh, there's looks like a man sitting on top of it. There's a lot of lights. And he said, oh my goodness, he says, uh, it looks like the glory. Ezekiel had a vision of a storm cloud. Inside the cloud are four strange creatures. They had four faces. Then he saw four wheels. These creatures were supporting a platform. Now this is important because we see that this is a mobile throne of God. It's like God, okay, God's got this mobile throne. It moves around. It's got wheels, and if you're talking about all terrain, he can roll or fly. He's got wheels, and he's got angel wings. So <clears throat> God had all terrain vehicles before we did. So here, here we see the glory of God is on this, this vehicle, and so his, we see this idea that the throne is movable. It can, it can move around. <clears throat> then on the platform is the throne. So he sees uh, this man on top of this throne, these wheels. He's sitting on the throne. is a human-like creature glowing, it says in the Scriptures. Then he realizes what uh, is looking at and says the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So all of a sudden he's sitting there on the riverbank five years into captivity. He was supposed to be a priest. He looks up, heavens open up. Now, what he's seeing is not a picture show. What he's seeing is into the heavens. He's seeing reality. He's seeing spiritual reality. The mobile throne of God was right above him, and he saw it. Now, God first spoke to Ezekiel from his chariot throne. He commissions Ezekiel as a prophet. Uh, he, uh, he was to accuse Israel... He was to accuse them of worshiping other gods. So here he's, he's commissioned as a prophet. He didn't make it as a priest. He wasn't in Jerusalem. He wasn't at the temple. He was captured on a canal bank. He's sitting there to be a priest. God, heaven's open. God looks down at him and says, you are now a prophet. So has anybody had the Lord change your plans? Okay, so you were not the first one that God changed your great plans. Here, Ezekiel worked a whole lifetime to be a priest. God captures. Anybody feel like they've been captured and moved by God? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I bet it changed your plans. Hmm. Yes, it did. So here we go. We can see that this is a pattern that God has. Like it or not, it's his pattern. It's the way he does things. <clears throat> and I've said it to you before, and this out of this type thing is the reason I say it. If you don't know how you got to where you are, God was getting you there all the time. That's exactly cool. Ezekiel didn't know how he got there, but there he was there. But if he not had not have been there, he wouldn't have been called by God and commissioned to be a prophet. He was called to be a prophet. God commissioned him, and he said, Now I want you to go to accuse Israel of their sin. He is to warn them of intimate destruction of the temple. So here Ezekiel's on the riverbank. But God says, you need to warn Israel, I'm going to destroy the temple back in Jerusalem. You know that had to be sad to the new prophet because he wanted to be priest in that temple. But God gave him the understanding that it was going to be destroyed. Now we get to Ezekiel's chapter 4 and 5. If you want to get more detail, you can go back in the previous weeks and get that. Ezekiel's chapter 4 and 5, Ezekiel has what we call sign acts. <coughs> and the reason I keep bringing this up and mentioning it is I want you to start seeing a likeness in your life to Ezekiel. We put Ezekiel way up here, but what we need to understand, you'll start seeing a parallel in your life as with Ezekiel's. And then you'll also start seeing a sign acts. In other words, God will have you do certain things. You're like, but this is, but God, why? Why, why do you want me to, to, to do this? Has anybody ever had the revelation? Let's put it this way, during worship to come get a flag and go around. Has anybody ever had that one? Has anybody ever had it and not do it? I see how honest you really are. Okay. <clears throat> well, what is that? It's a sign act. Because you can say, well, what good is waving a piece of material? What is that? I don't, I don't get it. The only thing I can say is if you don't get it, don't judge it or you'll get it. 
That is a key to the prophetic. <laughs> don't, don't judge the prophetic word of another, especially when we get into these sign acts. When God has us, uh, uh, for instance, the Lord could say, you could be somebody here or whatever, and the Lord says, I go up and give that person a hug. You say, oh my goodness, God, they might knock me down, might slap me. Well, that'll be another sign, but nonetheless, you, uh, I'm just saying in the prophetic, there's different sign acts that God call us into, and they actually are a point of obedience. Ezekiel performed sign type of street theater. He would perform parables for his messages. Same way in doing a flag, this is an easy one, but that's a parable or it's a message. Usually the person who the Lord says to get a banner or a flag, usually they tend to have a particular color in mind. Has anybody ever noticed that? I'm like, what the deal's a color? Right? What's a color deal? They'll go up there and they fumble. I'm like, they're all the same size. They all got a stick, <laughs> you know. But then there's like they're looking for the, uh, and then, oh, yeah, there it is. And I'm like, well, okay, there it is. <clears throat> but you got to understand, to the, to the prophetic person that's doing the sign act, that color means something. <clears throat> so there again, don't judge it or you'll have to wave three flags <laughs> with your foot and two hands or something. Now, Israel was not going to listen to him because of their hard hearts. So here God told his prophet to go change the priest and the prophets. They go lay on the ground for a year, do all these things. But oh yeah, they're not going to listen to you. So we see here that the prophetic voice cannot gauge anything by how well people listen to you. It could be that God's wanting it declared. And we don't understand why God wants us to declare it. <clears throat> now, after about a year, Ezekiel has another vision. I pointed this out, I think, last week. The reason it uh, got, why did God wait a year to give him the second vision? Well, it took him a year to lay on his side. Right? God told him <laughs> he had to lay on his side a year, it says. Well, I don't know. I wasn't exactly there. But I do know it took a year. <laughs> Surely not. But I don't know. Maybe he had a spot, you know, he did eight hour shifts or something. But anyway, he did it for a year. And so he fulfilled this commissioning by God for a year. But you got to understand, he had to fulfill the first commissioning before he got the second commissioning. There again, if God tells you to wave a flag, you need to go wave it because your last, your, 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 your next revelation is at your last point of obedience. Can the prophetic voice hear that? Yes. Your next revelation is at your last point of obedience. So we see here Ezekiel's last point of obedience was to lay in the road for a year. I don't recommend 64. And he was to lay there for a year. His last point of obedience was his next place of revelation. A lot of times we want to skip a point of obedience and get on to more revelation, that's when you have to make up the prophetic because it just doesn't work. <clears throat> so here's a year goes by. This is in chapters 8 uh, through 11. And this is where we'll pick up again here today. It is the temple vision, a virtual tour. So here we have Ezekiel sitting there on the, on the riverbank. He's 30 years old. He's not a priest. He's now a prophet. God says, I want you to go prophesy to this people for a year. And oh, yeah, they're not going to listen to you, but do it anyway. So he goes and he does it. <clears throat> then God gives him another revelation. Now, now, now hear this. I said it last week. I'll say it again. E Ezekiel was on the riverbank, and he, was one, he knew he was looking at the throne of God, at the glory of God. He knew he was. Now, that wasn't a, just a picture show. It wasn't a, it was the real thing. Now, let, let me say it to you like this. Church is all about the presence. A lot of people say, well, let's just do teaching. Let's just do, well, I'm all in for all of that, but it's all about presence. If, if you, if, uh, let's say that uh, Pastor Steve is off in another room somewhere, and I say, and I say, somebody go get, I need Pastor Steve's presence right here. Now, when I say I need his presence here, 
Does, I need, does that mean I need for us, everybody to play like he's here? Or does he have to be here? So before Steve's presence can be here, <clears throat> guess what? Steve has to be here. Now, you should feel a witness of the Holy Ghost right there. When we say the presence of the Lord's here, we're saying he's here. He's in the house. So when you can feel, I can feel his presence right now. Can, is anybody else? I just started it just 30 seconds ago, but I can feel his presence. Once I felt his presence, guess what? He's in the house. Right. <laughs> now, it just so happens I'm very nervous right now because I know he's watching and listening. I am ready to move over at any time. And so when, as you're speaking and this happens and you feel his presence, this, this thing comes over me like I'm just all, it's like I'm scared within an inch of my life because I know the Lord has to be here before I can feel his presence. So we know that, the, so this, what is this congregation about? It's, it's about the presence. This, this, I mean, we give up. We give up. That's what, it, yeah, we're going to teach and we're going to do all this stuff. But it's about the presence of God. And when we feel his presence, it's a big deal. Right. Because we know that he's here. Amen. Does that make sense? Yep. So here you got Ezekiel. He's on the river bank and he's, and he's here. And he looks up and he sees the presence of God in a vision. Now the difference right now is he saw it, we sense it, feel it. All right? We sense it and we feel it. One, one easy way for me is I want to cry. Does anybody else have the cry thing? Yeah, I get so frustrated at myself. I, yeah, Michael, I say, he's just, you just talk about it, and I, he'd start, you can't really care on a conversation with the guy sometimes. He just starts crying. You know, you know, you're like, okay, I guess, I guess we've had a discussion. So, and, and so that's one way you can really feel his presence. I hate to tell you this, but I can feel it on my legs, right, all the way down to my feet for some reason. I can just feel, I hope the, the presence of the Lord. Wow, I can sure feel it. Now, so Ezekiel looks up, he sees God. Not only does he see God, he's wondering, why is God, why is he here on his throne? Why is the glory of God here when the glory of God is supposed to be in the, in the temple? But it's in Babylon, because it's right there. And he says, what, it, what is this? So then God speaks to him. I have his throne, tells him, commissions him, say, go do all this mess for a year. Go to Israel. They're not going to listen to you. So he does all that. A year later, you start into chapter 8. God gives Ezekiel another vision. Now this vision is telling him how the first vision got there. In other words, this vision is the backstory to the first vision. Are you with me? Yep. So we're going to go into more detail. So here was what you pick up in chapter 8. Uh, you can see this. It says, then the glory of the Lord departed. Ezekiel, it, it, the actual departure was Ezekiel 10, 18. But we're going to go to Ezekiel chapter 8. Uh, you can actually turn there in your Bibles uh, if you, if you have your Bibles, I ask you to turn there uh, to Ezekiel chapter 8. And it's in Ezekiel chapter 10, we know that the glory of God departs. I, I just showed you that uh, slide there. It's Ezekiel 10, 18. All right, the glory departs, and, and when it departs the temple... That mobile glory or, or throne of God leaves the temple in Jerusalem. And where does it go? It goes to Babylon right above Ezekiel. Are you with me? So it departs in Ezekiel 10, 18. <clears throat> and then when it departs, it was right above Ezekiel. Now we're going to look... Uh, at when the, we know that the glory ended up in front of Ezekiel, but there was, a, there was a departure of the glory of God from the temple 
in Jerusalem for it to end up in Babylon. Now Ezekiel had a vision showing the glory departing from the temple. We see that it was not a sudden departure, but a what? But it was a gradual one. Now how many people have got your Bibles? You turn to Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 1. And it came to pass in the sixth year and the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord fell there, did what? Upon me. So what happened? The hand of the Lord fell upon Ezekiel. Verse 2, Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins even downward, fire from his loins even upward, is the appearance of brightness as the color of amber. Verse 3, And he put forth the form of a hand and took me by the lock of my head. Now, I've mentioned that last week for you that are bald. You'll just have to take our word for it. God took him by the hair of the head, it says here, and it jerked him up. And the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looked towards the north. Now here he was, he was in Babylon, he was sitting here with these elders. All of a sudden he has this vision, the Spirit of the Lord picks him up with the hair of the head, jerks him up between heavens and the earth, over Jerusalem, he looks down in Jerusalem to the door of the inner gate that looks towards the north. So he's looking at that front door there, the inner gate, where the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoked to jealousy. And behold, the glory of God of Israel was there according to the vision that I saw in the plain. So the first thing that Ezekiel saw when the glory was departing, he went to kind of the front door and he saw this image and, and of, of jealousy. So that tells all of us something. That tells us that when we are enticed with jealousy, you can say, well, we don't have jealous people in the church. Well, yeah, well if, if God's here, the first thing you'll be enticed with is jealousy. In other words, you'll, you'll want a gift that somebody else has. If you don't get it and you don't have it, you'll try to tear them down. That's, that's the way it works. <clears throat> jealousy is mean. Did you know that? Yes. <laughs> jealousy is very mean. It's very deceptive. There's not a human on the planet that has and is not enticed with jealousy. You can think you aren't, but uh, the enemy wouldn't be doing his job if he didn't try to entice us all. <clears throat> now, here it says, First place of glory, Ezekiel 8, 4, And therefore before me was the glory of God of Israel, as in the vision I had seen in the plain. Here we see that the glory was in its place in the Holy of Holies above the Ark's mercy seat in Cherubim. Today we know as the temple is our what? We know that today is the temple is our heart. So we know that it is a hard issue for individuals today. Now here's what we want to understand. The glory will not do what? Cohabitate. The glory will not cohabitate with jealousy. Amen. It starts departing. When you feel like you can't feel God or you couldn't, uh, you, all of a sudden you're getting sad, you can't feel God, you get, you'll get very, you'll complain a lot. That's what, that's what happened with Israel. The complaining spirit, you, you just, I'm not saying that there's not times that we need to look at ourselves and each other. And I'm not saying that we don't say when things are not correct. But there's a difference in that and complaining. To me, if you had, I do the three rule. If you've got to say it three times, it's probably a complaint. Right? So what happens is we see that complaining is the beginning of, or it is a, complaining is like a sneeze to a cold. If, if, if you've got jealousy, it's a good chance you're going to be a complainer. <clears throat> now, we see that the glory will not cohabitate. Jealousy is the first step of the glory departing. This is in Ezekiel 8, 3. The Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven, and visions of God took me to Jerusalem, to the entrance, to the north gate of the inner court, where the idol that provokes to jealousy stood. Jealousy is an image of what? Of Baal. It's idol worship. <clears throat> so begins the departure. Now, I'm not saying you're not saved when the presence departs. You can still be saved, still be born again. But there's a difference in having the presence of God in your life 
We we have to understand, the glory of God does not cohabitate with certain behavior. It it just doesn't. You say, well, Alan, what about grace? Well, it'll get you in. It'll give you time to get it right. But there's a difference in being acceptable and being a habitation. There's a difference. Here we go. Then Ezekiel was shown unclean beasts and idols. If you're in your Bibles, we'll uh, move over to verse 6. He said, Furthermore unto me, son of man, seest thou what they do, even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary, but turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. And he brought me to the door of the court. <clears throat> and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold, the wicked abominations that they do here. <clears throat> That's in Ezekiel. He speaks about these wicked abominations. Our hearts have a wall around them. We see here a doorway also into our hearts. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of what? Creeping things, an abominable beast, and all the idols of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. What he's saying here is he's looked around, and the wall of, this, of the temple was all of these abominable things. And so we have to ask ourselves, well, I can do this and this and this and this because of the grace of God. The only thing I can tell you is you're hanging on the wall of your heart abominable wall things. That's like a bomb abominable snowman. Your things. We're putting junk in our hearts and we're hanging it on the walls. And we're thinking it doesn't make any difference. What the grace of God does, it keeps God from smashing you like a bug. And me, it's called the cross of Christ. Yes, we're not smashed. But still, that's not you. We have been set free to live unto Him. And there's a difference in getting by and living unto Him. That's what this teaching is about. So here we see that Ezekiel looks into the hearts or into the temple here in Jerusalem. And they have all of these idols and all of It's amazing how quickly they messed up the temple. It's just so amazing. Now, here's the third step of departure. It was temple prostitution and false gods. Now, we can feel like, well, that's, you know, that one's got us covered, but let's look here and see. Ezekiel 8, 14. Then he brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the house of the Lord, and I saw women sitting there mourning for Tammuz. Now, Tammuz was, uh, he was originally a Babylonian sun god called Desron, the husband of Ishtar, the goddess of fertility. The worship of these deities was introduced into Syria. Tammuz was an antichrist, a false messiah that ultimately deceived millions. Uh, just a very easy example. Are you watching movies that have sexual content? That's, that's, they, they just had different... Well, we're all grown-ups here. I don't have to go into that. Y'all know what it's talking about. Now, because of compromise of the people of God, the glory moved from above the cherub, cherubim to the threshold of the temple. So it's like the glory of God, the presence of God was trying to move. In other words, we can, we can totally have the presence of God in this place. And the presence of God will move. You, you got to understand, the, the question you want to ask yourself, if there seems like there's a lot of the presence of God going on up here, I'd ask myself, why isn't the presence of God going on around me? Now, you think I'm kidding, but I'm not kidding. We draw the presence. The presence of God will still be in here, but if we got, uh, I don't have to say, y'all get it, don't you? Yes. Okay. Now, so here we go. Ezekiel 9, 3. Now the glory of God of Israel went up from above the cherub where it had been and moved to the threshold of the temple. The glory departed from the threshold to the south end of the temple. So you can see the glory of God was moving around trying to stay in there. Ezekiel 10, 3. 
<clears throat> now the cherub stood on the right side of the house when the men went in and the cloud filled the inner court. Here we start seeing the exit. <clears throat> then the glory of the Lord departed off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. The glory departed from the cherub and came to stand at the east gate. Here we can see that the glory of God has been all the way around the temple. It's coming here to, this, to the east gate and it's getting ready to leave there and go in front of Ezekiel in chapter 1. Here we see it, Ezekiel chapter 10. While I watched, the cherubim spread their wings, rose from the ground, and as they, uh, as they what? went, the wheels went with them. They stopped at the entrance to the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of God of Israel was above them. The glory was one more step further uh, from its rightful place. Now we're going to go into the fourth step of departure. Devising iniquity and giving wicked counsel. Now this one's huge. What happens is when people come into the house of God, and I know uh, some people today have a problem with calling this building a house of God, but let me tell you something. This building is a house of God. The reason it is, it has been set aside for that purpose. And if you want to know how that works, stay around for the next teaching. Uh, but this is a house of God. This is a place that we have set aside for that. Now, we don't. when people come here, you need to be careful how you run your yap. Because here is where we give people counsel. It happens a lot here. We speak with people. We talk with people. You do. I do. You'll have a word of the Lord. You'll have all of these things. What we have to be responsible for is what comes out of our mouth so that we don't fall under this one, devising iniquity and giving wicked counsel. The household of God is not the place to run a game. Can you hear me? Now, I'm going to say it out loud. I have seen situations, we have experienced situations, where people come in with all of this marketing, pyramid marketing stuff. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Is this the elephant in the room or no? The church house of God is not a place to come in and do Amways, Arbonnes, and everything else. That's not what this is. Amen. This is not a place for you to run a game. If you want to do some type of pyramid structure, do it out of here. Just go and get all of it you want. Don't do it with your connections in here because you'll be guilty of this one. Is everybody selling stuff or is anybody in agreement? Amen. This is a big no-no to running off the glory of God out of a... And I know a lot of people today, it's even happened here, that will come in selling all this stuff, trying to, to... And it just parasites on the congregations what it does. And everybody thinks it's good. Well, I make people better. No, we don't need all your stuff. We got God. Thank you. We come here for God and His Spirit and His presence. This is not a place to sell stuff. Somebody say amen. amen. Okay, now that we've got that one out of the way, and I will get some emails on that one. Ezekiel 11. Then the Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the gate of the house of the Lord that faces east. There at the entrance to the gate were 25 men, and I saw among them leaders of the people. The Lord said to me, Son of man, these are men who are plotting evil and giving wicked advice in the city. Amen. This is, <laughs> you got to understand something. When the anointing and the habitation of the Lord is in a place, the ability of wisdom through this power of the Holy Spirit increases. And as this increases, you need to understand that your selfishness within you will use that to persuade men. We've got to be sure that we're under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And when we're under that influence of the Holy Spirit, me included, we all can be guilty of this. Plotting evil and giving wicked advice. We can all be guilty of that. You just take that up with the Holy Ghost. Now, at the end of the vision, God promises that He will return a remnant back to the land. He promises that He will transform them. 
Now, this is good news for Ezekiel. Ezekiel is supposed to prophesy for a year. Uh, da 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 da. da. Uh, nobody's going to pay attention to you. Then he gives him this second vision of how the glory departed from the temple. What the? If you want to know more about the glory of God, just go to Ezekiel chapter eight. You can do a much more intensive study on chapter eight, nine, and ten about the glory departing. And I just encourage you to do that. It's it's not what we think it would be, you know, on the departure. <clears throat> but here, I guess uh, God was trying to give Ezekiel a little bit of encouragement. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, by, by the way, Ezekiel, there will be a time that I'm going to save a remnant out of this poor lot. He promises this uh, in chapter 11. I'll go ahead and throw it in so we'll see what God will say. And then I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them. Has anybody ever read this verse? <clears throat> and take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. You remember this verse? <clears throat> that they may walk in the statues and keep my judgments and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. But as for those whose hearts follow the desire for the detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. So here we see that God does give Ezekiel a little encouragement that there will be a day that there will be a remnant. Now let's get back to the glory departing. Now the glory departed from the east gate and stood on the mountain. Here we see, finally, the glory of God leaves the temple. It departs up on top of the mountain. Verse 23, Then the cherub with the wheels beside them spread their wings, and the glory of God of Israel was above them. The glory of the Lord went up from within the city and stopped above the mountain east of it. Here we can see that there has been a departure. The glory has now fully departed from the temple and the people of God. What we want to understand that the glory of God is not usually just instantaneous. The glory of God, when it leaves, it's usually gradual. God gives us all time to repent or to, to reconsider our ways, whatever we're doing, so that we can keep the presence of God in our lives. To be able to, to live life without a blessed life of God is a scary place to be. And uh, that's what happened. Now, I'm so glad I'm out of the glory leaving because I want to talk about the glory returning. Have y'all got about it leaving down pat so I don't have to do that anymore now? Now, the, the good news about it leaving is God promised it would return. So when, we, when the glory returns, we find ourselves living in a day and an age in which we are experiencing some of the return of the glory of God to planet Earth. That's the reason the demonic side is so stirred up. Trust me, the demonic darkness realizes that there's something on the way Amen. and that it's starting to invade the earth. It's called the presence of God. Now here we see, it's in 1 Corinthians 3.16. Know ye not that ye are what? The temple of God and the Spirit of God does what? dwells in you. Now that's, that's a big statement. The, 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 the presence of God, you understand this, when the Israel was in the wilderness, the presence of God was in a tabernacle. They, they get put down a tabernacle and the presence of God came into the tabernacle. Now I submitted to you a few weeks ago, I think one reason they went around the mountain for 40 years is because God didn't want to settle down. I mean, he just took them, they wore, they wore that mountain out. Going round and round. And, and, and why? Well, they said they were going to build a temple. David wanted to build a temple and all this. And God finally said, okay, go ahead and build me a temple. But if you'll notice, he didn't really want to stay there because he didn't. Has anybody notice that? He kept tearing the thing down so they had to rebuild it. Why? Because God liked a movable tabernacle. He wants one that moves. I don't know. He gets antsy or something. So, so God's 
main, his big plan was, I'm going to save a people. I'm going to make them the temple. And I'm going to reside in that temple. There we get the revelation, Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is Christ in you, the hope of glory? Christ in you, the hope of glory is God wanted to be in a movable tabernacle. So you can see how this glory departing from the temple has everything to do with it departing from our tabernacle. This is now the tabernacle. Same story. Nothing changes except of being stone, it's now flesh. So we see that and we have that understanding. Paul comes on the scene with the revelation that we are now this temple tabernacle of God. Now God promised Moses something. Back there in the Old Testament, this is in Numbers 14. He said, Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people according unto the greatness of thy mercy, and as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even unto now. <clears throat> and the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word, but as truly as I live, all the earth shall be what? Filled with what? The glory, the glory of the Lord. Now here's the story. God was getting ready to wipe out Israel. You remember the story? God said, I've had it up to here. I'm going to wipe them out. Moses went to God on behalf of Israel and said, God, now, mate, settle down here a little bit. If you do that, it's going to give you a bad name. I got a feeling God didn't care. Now, <laughs> Moses said, but God, you're going, to, you're going to give yourself and your people a bad name if you, if you rub them out. And God said, okay, I'm going to make a deal with you, Moses. I'm not going to rub them out. Now, this is some deal, but this is what he said. God said, I'm going to make a deal with you. I'm not going to rub them out, but I promise you this, Moses. I, it's, I always thought it was funny. God said, as surely as I live, of course he lives. He said, just as surely as I live, the earth shall be filled with my what? Glory. Why? Because that's what God had in mind all the time. God created the heaven and earth. Why? For his glory to reside with man. God's going to have his way on this story. I don't care how bad we mess it up. God's going to have his way. And somebody say, glory, he's going to have his way. Aren't you glad he's going to have his way? Yes. So God makes his promise to Moses. He said, okay, Moses. Okay, I won't rub them out, but I promise you one thing, that this earth is going to be filled with my glory. Now that verse, if I've ever had a verse, that's my verse. Because I know God meant business when he said that. Not only did I know he meant business, I knew he was going to do that thing. The only thing I knew, I've been called to be on the, I've been called to be catcher. Y'all can play first, second base, I'm catcher. Because I want to catch this glory when God sends it to the earth. Because he's made a promise. Now I personally believe that when God does this thing and as he does it and he is doing it, that this is one place that will be ground zero for that verse. Now, preparing for the return of glory, the people of God were not ready for God's glory when Jesus came 2,000 years ago. That was the beginning of God sending His glory to the earth was Jesus. So God sent John the Baptist ahead of Christ, preparing the way. What was the message of John? Repent. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, right? So here we see that John had a message. He was preparing the way of the Lord. Now I'm suspicious the reason the Holy Ghost has stirred up the baptismal waters again is because of the return of His glory. It's just not a coincidence. Can somebody hear me? Absolutely. Listen, we can't skip a revelation and go on to the next. Right. We have to do the previous revelation to get the next revelation. And I'm very suspicious that that's what we have going on. <clears throat> and I guess I'm going to need to stop there. Let me do one more. Preparing the way. <clears throat> this is what it says in Isaiah. Now let's watch it, and I'll stop on this one. But The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, do what? Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for, uh, for our God. 
For every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And look here. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it. How? Together. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. The mouth of the Lord spoke that. Well, we know that John the Baptist prepared the way and he gave us the message of preparing the way. Now, here's the key. We have all been called to prepare the way. Amen. Prepare the way. We prepare the way of the Lord. Let's stand. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you, oh God, for your word and your way. And Lord Jesus... I do pray if there's anything that I've said that's not of you, I pray that it'll just fall to the ground. And if anything, oh God, that I have said that's of you, I pray, oh God, that it'll be quickened to our hearts, that we might be filled with your Spirit. Fill our hearts and our mouths this day, oh God, with worship, worshiping you, calling for your glory to hit this place is our prayer. In Jesus' holy name, amen and amen.